before I start the video, please give me support on Patreon. Any kind of donation is greatly appreciated. Also, follow my Instagram where you can stay updated with my posts and I will personally connect with you. That's at the trip keeper on Instagram. Thank you all so much. I suppose you'd say we are a ragtag group of punks, skaters, and wooks that coexisted within the same circle of friends. There were about a dozen of us who lived together in a two-bedroom apartment that was rented to our friend Jason Burns, the only one of us at the time who was responsible enough to have a job delivering pizzas and paying rent. The rest of us between the ages of 18 through 20 were still sort of just floating through life avoiding anything that resembled adulting. One day, six of us were hanging out at Danielle's house, a girl we had met about a week prior. Her folks were out of town for the weekend, she thought it would be a good idea to have us over. Her parents' house was located in the Woodward Park neighborhood, a middle to upper class community of Fresno, California. This house was more in the upper class area, white plush carpets, white couches, beautiful vases, high vaulted ceilings with extraordinary lighting features. It seemed like everything was pure white in this house. Super fancy, you get the idea. Around 3 p.m., a few of us walked to a nearby grocery store for drinks and snacks. We cut through a field of plowed dirt and weeds along the way to make the trip shorter. Myself being an avid user of psilocybin cubensis and LSD in those days, as well as my mother having given me numerous Carlos Castaneda books when I was a kid, certainly helped me to identify various other hallucinogenic plants. As we crossed through this field, I recognized a familiar one growing all around us, the Tura. We collected a bunch of the seed pods, filled our backpacks, and took them back to Danielle's house. We sat at a table on the back patio and cut open the pods, removing the light golden brown seeds and collecting them in a large cooking pot. It measured about 12 by 8 inches tall or so. We filled the bottom 2 inches with seeds and the rest of the pot with water. We heated those up for about an hour, creating a very foul smelling tea of sorts. The six of us, plus Danielle, and another girl she had over, all filled glasses or cups to about 10 ounces and began sipping this stuff. This formula was entirely made up on the spot. We didn't have Google to refer to. This is absolutely not how anyone should ever take Datura. It was disgusting and almost impossible to get down. So we decided to pour it all back in the pot and take other measures. We found frozen strawberries in the freezer and a canned fruit cocktail in the cupboards poured some Datura tea in a blender, and added in the fruit to create a very heinous kind of smoothie. Lee, Doug, and myself were the last three people to pull the remaining pulpy tea from the bottom of the pot and pour it into the blender with the fruit to make our glasses. I believe the bottom of the pot had to be the most potent, judging by the three of our reactions to it compared to the remainder of the group. I sat on the far right end of an L-shaped sectional couch in the living room. To my left was Lee. Across from us in chairs sat Doug, Mike, Jason, Jeremy, and the two girls. Roughly about 8-10 to 10 minutes after drinking my glass, I began to notice some unusual sensations starting in my stomach and my face. My stomach felt grumbled and warm. My face felt flush. I turned to my left and told Lee, I think I'm fucked up, Lee. He asked, What do you mean? I went on to explain how I was feeling and told him that I think I might have drank too much. He said, I think I did too. I believe I drank about 8 ounces of pulpy Jimson weed that was blended with fruit to mask the taste. The very next thing I recall was projectile vomiting directly out in front of me, blasting outwards 3 feet forward all over that plush white carpet. I was wearing shorts, leaning over now, I began to puke down my shins. Socks and shoes coated in vomit. It's running down my legs. It's everywhere. I leaned back and to my right, my face went into the arm of the couch. This all occurred at around 9 p.m., as the sun hadn't been down that long when we drank our portions. The very next memory I have, I was walking down the middle of a residential street. My memory just sort of fades into where I'm walking. I don't remember leaving anywhere. I don't remember making the decision to walk anywhere. My memory just went from puking to walking down the middle of the street. 
The sky was shifting from black to dark blue. The sun would be rising soon. We were all walking together, side by side. No cars really out yet. We're now in Tarpey Village, a neighborhood about nine miles away from Danielle's house, where our trip began. I realized we were on my friend Trista Street, and I saw her house on the left. We went up and knocked on the door. She answered, and we were talking. I'm not even sure what about. Didn't seem too long after that, a police car pulls up across the street. The officer gets out and walks right up to me. He forcibly turns me around and puts me in handcuffs and walks me to his car. He then puts me in the back seat and gets in the front seat himself. The officer then turns his head over his shoulder and asks me, What are you on? To which I answer, I'm not on anything. He then said, All right, well we'll just wait for the ambulance then. I asked, Ambulance? I'm not hurt. Why would I need an ambulance? He said, Just hang tight. They'll be here soon. The ambulance arrives and he takes me out of the back seat and they lay me down face first on a gurney. They put some form of straps in place over my lower back and ankles and after removing the cuffs they strap my wrists and head down as well. I don't recall being combative at all during this encounter. I asked the officer as they're loading me up in the ambulance if one of my friends can ride with me. The officer laughs at me and says, no, your friends will have to stay here. I don't recall any of the ride but I am, at some point, now on my back on some other type of gurney, with my right wrist bound to the corner in what seems like a leather restraint. My left ankle is bound to the foot of the bed, just the same. Doctors come in every once in a while and ask what year it is. Who is the president? Where are you? I feel like I'm nailing it. Bill Clinton, Valley Medical Center, 1995. Off and on, I notice to my left across the room that there is a Hispanic man who has been stabbed by his girlfriend from what he says. He's strapped down the same way as I am, and he's often telling me to shut the fuck up, though I don't feel like I've said anything to him at all. I observe very clearly with my eyes at some point, my friend Nate, standing with one foot on the arm of my bed, and the other foot on the arm of the Hispanic man's bed. He's got a screwdriver, and he's unscrewing the speakers from the ceiling. Nate was a clever thief in these days, it seemed fitting. What seems like several hours after I arrived, they made a call to my mother. They asked her, Does your son have psychotic episodes? She said, No, never. So they tell her I'm probably okay enough that she can come get me. They cut me loose from the bed and escort me into another room where my mother and aunt are waiting. My mother hugs me and starts asking questions. The hospital staff hand me some forms to sign and they give me a sock and my belt. This sock was one that I had never seen in my life. It has a last name embroidered on it or something. It seems fancy, maybe something a golfer would wear. I don't know. All I know for sure, it's not mine and they're trying to send me home without my shoes. I just bought a pair of Etnies that cost me $90 and though I spaced the fact that I had puked on them the night before, I knew I wasn't leaving without my damn shoes. They insisted that I came with nothing other than that one stupid sock. Finally, I took the sock. Angry, I just wanted to get out of the hospital, so I went to my mother's house barefooted. I called the apartment that we all lived in, and Jeremy answered, Lupo! What the fuck happened, dude? Where'd you go? He said. What do you mean, where'd I go? Why didn't one of you guys come with me to the hospital? What the fuck are you talking about? He asks. I'm confused at this point because he should know full well what I'm talking about. He was there and saw the ambulance take me. He then interjects with a summary to try and clear things up for me. Look, you were face down in the arm of the couch all night. We were off in another room. At some point someone says, Lupo is gone, but we didn't figure you went very far because your shoes were by the door. I stopped him there. What? You have my shoes? He then says, uh, no. They're still by that door. They had puke all over them, fuck that. Confused by everything, I decided to call Trista, the girl whose door I was arrested at earlier that morning. She answers and I ask her, hey. Why exactly was I arrested last night? Do you know? She then says, Huh? So I ask again, Why was I arrested last night? What did I do? She goes on to say, I'm not exactly sure what you're talking about, Lupo. I haven't seen you in maybe three weeks. You got arrested? Now my head is completely fucked. My mother has her friend, who is a 911 dispatcher, to look into my arrest in their system and informs my mom that the call came in that a man was approaching houses in the Woodward Park area early in the AM, looking in windows and knocking on doors. Holy shit. Everything comes together now in my head. 
I can't remember any of it, but I can only do the math one way. Apparently, I must have pulled myself from that couch in a daze, took my pukey shoes and socks off, leaving me in need of replacements. I made my way into Danielle's parents' room and located one of her father's socks, settling on just one sock, I guess. I made my half-barefooted, half-socked way down the residential street in Danielle's upscale neighborhood. I began knocking on random windows and doors, offering up what I can only imagine to be colorful and friendly 5.52 a.m. conversation to the upper class just around the corner from where I first started out. I never made it anywhere near Trista's house in Tarpey Village nine miles away. I never spoke to her in person that morning. I thought that I was with all my friends, but I was really alone at strangers' doors. It's no wonder the cop laughed at me. I called Jeremy back and gave him my updated hypothesis of my experience, and he then filled me in on what else took place while I was face-planted in the couch and later gone on my one-socked solo spirit quest. As it went, every single person who consumed the Datura cocktail ended up vomiting somewhere in the house, puke fucking everywhere. Doug was seeing dimensionally flip-flopped, so a corner in a room appeared as a sharp edge corner, say like one on the right as you enter a hallway. That would have been fine, except the sharp edge corners appeared as inverted corners in a room that you couldn't hurt yourself on. Needless to say, Doug busted his face up real bad on those inverted corners, leaving bloodstains all about the house walls. Doug later found a tree that was crafted of silk, and I don't know what else, but it was real fancy-like, and it reached way up towards the vaulted ceilings, until he decided to climb it. So now we have shreds of silk fabric from what was some kind of decorative tree all strewn about the house. Puke on the white carpets, I guess they weren't white, but they were like, as close as you could get for a carpet. Jason decided to puke in one of the vases, and then made his way into the restroom, where Mike was sitting on the toilet, both shitting and puking down the floor in front of him. Jason told Mike, I need to piss. Mike told him he was stuck, and there was no way he could manage to stand up or get off the toilet to allow Jason to piss. Jason then rationalized that the one choice he was left with was pissing as close to the toilet as possible, that being the puddle of Mike's puke on the floor. I'm not sure what the next line of thought was that went through Jason's mind, but our best guess is that it went something like this. If puke were a fire, and my urine can extinguish fires, there are other fires throughout this house, including the one I left in that vase. So I must now try to piss on all those puddles of puke. And he did a pretty good job of that. So we have puke everywhere, a lot of piss in or around the areas where the puke has ended up. Shreds of silk strewn about, blood on the walls, and apparently they found Danielle's father's shotguns while rummaging through the house. And I'm really surprised nobody was hurt. Jeremy found a briefcase that belonged to Danielle's mother and proclaimed to everyone that it was stacked with hundreds of thousands of dollars, like in the movies. They broke the locks on it and found only work documents and files, to which he then explained to them were top secret documents and gave them the whole story behind their existence. At some point in the night, our friends Matt, Ashton, and Joram arrived. They were not on the Datura tea, and they spent the rest of the night trying to babysit us, but it was all in vain. Too many of us going different ways, fucking up too many things for them to keep up. It's so funny to listen to their telling of the events because they had a completely sober viewing of it all. Matt told me later that they had made a trip to 7-Eleven to get one of those giant fountain drinks with the folding cardboard lid, like a huge milk carton. We were all pretty broken these days, so sharing a large soda among a group was certainly a thing. Anyway, they're getting the soda at 7-Eleven, and a couple super cute girls start chatting them up. They want to hang out with my friends, but my friends are like, Fuck, we really want to, but we're babysitting a bunch of adults right now, and they're fucking shit up. We gotta get back to them. So they arrive with that huge vat of soda, and Matt says it's the one thing that broke me from that couch. He said I immediately sat up looking at him, just a solid stare, very serious, and he asked me, Lupo, do you want a drink of this? Laughing because it's so obvious I do. Datura gives you horrible cotton mouth. Weed cotton mouth isn't even cotton mouth, that's just dry. Datura, it fucks your mouth up. He offers the soda, apparently I nod yes and put my hands out to take the cup from him. He puts it in my hands and I guess I just didn't have any motor skills at all. I drop it, it burst open on the floor below and now nobody gets a drink now. I didn't fully get my eyesight back for three days following the trip. It was really blurry when I would try to read, and I was still seeing the occasional person in the room with me who wasn't really there at all. 
Sometimes I still wonder who the people were at the house I was arrested at, and what would have been going through their minds. Did they run into me at a store a couple years later, perhaps? Honey, look! It's that guy! That crazy barefooted one sock guy that was beating on our door at the crack of dawn that one time. Look! He has a wife and kids! He's trying to act all normal now! Datura Anoxia. That's one hell of a drug. I highly do not recommend anyone trying it. You never want to do something that will completely remove all of your motor skills, wipe large segments of your memory, and make you hallucinate so intensely that you actually see humans and other things that aren't actually standing there. You actually feel things in your hand that you're not holding as well. That shit is just too much. I could have been taken out by a car while walking in the street, if that's even where I was walking. Yeah. I just really need to stress to you that you'd certainly want to avoid ever giving thought to trying that shit. Look up Datura Trips online and try to find a story that's pleasant and calm. You really can't. So, this trip on Magic Mushrooms happened in March of 2021 and I still think about it daily. Before this trip, I had done mushrooms one time, and other than puking in the Giant Eagle parking lot, it was a really great time. So that's why I wasn't worried to try it again a couple days later. The day starts off doing normal shit, hanging out with my friend, we'll call him V. Throughout the day, we were drinking, and we started off with some champagne. As the day progressed, we kept on drinking beers, and I believe I had some liquor. So as you can tell, I was getting pretty tipsy. I'd say I was at that middle point where you were tipsy and felt drunk, but if you had one or two more beers, you definitely feel the alcohol strongly. That's the best way to describe it. I was feeling great, loving interactions, and just having a good time. The normal drinking stuff. Oh, and I believe I did take some Phenibut, which definitely affected the trip. I do not recommend mixing Phenibut with anything except Kratom. It can lead to some serious interactions that you do not want. I might do a whole video on Phenibut itself because it caused me nothing but pain. That's why that was the last time I did that stuff. Back to the story. Whenever I get drunk, I always get ideas in my head that I wouldn't get if I was sober. My alcohol and phenibut altered mind reminded me about the rest of the shrooms I had in my book bag. Remembering that I loved the trip last time I ate them, I decided that night I would take it again. But this was a lot more than the first time. The amount I did is hard to explain because I didn't weigh it or anything like that. The first time I did it, I think I ate about five or six full mushrooms with the stem, tip, and everything. I don't know if that's a lot, but it probably wasn't, considering I wasn't tripping too hard. I kinda just went off of that, but most of the mushrooms I had left were grinded up, like how you can grind weed. I definitely did a lot more than the first time, and the amount I took was probably around the size of one and a half golf balls. It's been a while, so I'm not really sure. I just remember it was quite a lot. Especially since most of it was grinded, and that's a lot more than just having the actual mushroom there. I put the shrooms in a blender with my fruit smoothie, and I could barely taste it. After I finished the whole concoction, I waited for it to kick in. I don't remember when it exactly kicked in, but when it did, I remember talking to V and seeing the world as like a melting picture. V's face started to shift and look cool, but if this was just the beginning, then I could only imagine what the rest of the trip was going to be like. I think seeing this world just melt around me made me freak out. By the way, I used to never freak out on Sykes, and I never had a bad trip before. I think I have done acid around 20 to 25 times in my life. When V started talking to me, his words sounded like there was some sort of echo after them. For example, if he would say something like, Hey dude, it would sound like, Hey hey, dude dude. This was making me really anxious, and I knew this was not going to be a fun trip. 
I was laughing at everything he was saying, not because I thought it was funny, but because I was nervous. I wanted it to stop, but then the talking got worse. Whenever I spoke, I would hear what I said inside my head like I was wearing headphones and my voice was overpowering everything else. I did not like this one bit. Soon later, with V's echo voice, it turned into backwards talk and I could not understand anything he was saying and prayed for it to be over. For example, he would say a sentence and I don't remember any of it so I'm just going to use a general example. Oh, lovely weather we're having today. That would sound like, having were weather oh today lovely. Something to that extent. And I told him this was happening. So he started doing it on purpose. At least, I think it was on purpose. So I just wanted to be alone in my bed after that. I tell him I think it's time for the night to be over, and he leaves. I thought this would make things better, but it only got worse from here. I believe this is when I started suffering a panic or anxiety attack. My heart was pounding, my body was shaking. I thought I was going to die, which I did. I'll explain soon. I tried to hide under the covers to make the trip go away, like it was some sort of demon trying to kill me. This worked for maybe like 5 seconds, but I went right back into extreme anxiety. I'm generally an anxious person, and I've had panic attacks many times before since 2019. It kinda just hit me one day, and I would get one once every couple months. When I was tripping though, I didn't think it was a panic attack, but I thought I was just dying. I started imagining myself being a mushroom in the ground, decomposing, and my mind just kept telling me, water. I thought if I drank some water, I'd be okay, so I had to go find some. Also, my house was completely dark at this point because I didn't want to see any visuals and make the trip worse. I found water and just took one big sip. I heard the gulp in my fucking brain. It sounded like it was in some speakers or some shit. I went back to my bed and decided to go on my phone and watch some YouTube videos to make it feel better. Unfortunately, that did not work and only made it worse because when I'd watch a video, the actual video would be horizontal, but I'd be visually seeing it vertically. I could not focus on it because it was literally impossible to watch it. The sound from the videos also sounded like it was some Dolby surround sound in my room. I didn't know what to do, so I kept on opening and closing the YouTube app completely freaking out, not knowing what I'm going to do next. I came up with some sort of saving grace, if you want to call it that. I called my best friend Tony and prayed he would answer the phone. He did, thank God, and I told him what I did and said I'm freaking out. He told me to calm down and said you're just having a bad trip, the normal stuff, which actually kind of helped. I started calming down talking to him, and he asked if he should come over. I was worried though, because my last friend that was over didn't help the trip, so I said, no, I'll just ride this out and hopefully not die. I told him to stay on the phone though, because that was the only time I was feeling okay. After a while though, I thought I was okay, so I eventually let him go and went to see if this trip would get better but it did not. This is when I started going into an almost endless loop where I do the same thing over and over again. I would get up off of my bed, grab another water and only take one sip, walk out of my side door to get fresh air, open my blinds to look outside, pet my cat on his head, then go back to my bed. I probably did this at least five to seven times or maybe more. After doing it so many times, this is when I started to believe I was dead. I was so far gone in this trip that I thought I didn't exist. I thought that I was just some soul living in purgatory or hell. 
I tried a bunch of things to convince myself that I was still alive, like touching my body, but I seriously could not feel it whatsoever. This made my anxiety grow to a level I've never felt before. I could not think of anyone from my friends or family. I could not figure out who or what my name was. I was just completely gone. If there was ever a bad trip, this would be one you sure wish you'd never have. I went to go get another water, and mind you, I've been finding new waters and just taking one sip and then leaving them on the floor. The next morning, there were like 10 waters all around my house. When I drank the water this time though, it felt like I had refreshed my body to feel somewhat alive again. After getting this refreshing feeling, I got a call, and it was from Tony. Seeing his name on my phone snapped me back to reality, so I answered it really quickly and before I even could say hello, I said in a crying voice, Dude, come over. He laughs in a we should have done this earlier kind of tone. It seemed like after that moment, a huge weight got lifted off of me. I got really hungry for some music after that, so I put on some Black Sabbath and Iron Man came on. And as I was listening to this song, I just pictured Ozzy, Tony Iommi, Geezer and Bill Ward in the studio just being super young kids having so much fun recording this crazy song. I could just picture them saying into the mic, I am Iron Man, and adding a bunch of effects to make it sound like how it does in the song and just laughing, smoking, and having the time of their lives. This made me really happy because they are one of my favorite bands and I love all their songs. It's a crazy sight to imagine yourself in the studio with them. It was almost like a dream. Although this happened, I was still having a breakdown and shaking like crazy still, but my mind was veering away from the anxiety and more onto the glowing aspect of the trip. The last scary thing that happened was that I couldn't put my shorts on. I could not tell which part of the shorts were the front or the back and I spent five minutes trying to put them on. I eventually figured it out and waited for Tony. When he came over, my anxiety and paranoia completely diminished. I almost felt gay in a way. I've never been so excited to see a man in my life before. I thanked him for coming and we just chilled on my couch and talked about my trip and our lives. We were best friends before this, but with my job, we haven't been able to hang out nearly as much. We were hanging out at least twice a week before I got my job, then it turned to like once every couple months once I started the job. Him coming over triggered a new spark in our friendship, and we've been hanging out a lot more since the trip. So I guess that's the only positive thing I could take away from that horrible night. All I could tell you guys is the cliche, don't be stupid or don't do what I did, but that's seriously true. I think I took way too much for only my second time doing shrooms, plus the alcohol and phenobut did not help me whatsoever. Definitely do not mix those unless you're doing a little bit of each. I definitely like to try shrooms again, but a dose comparable to my first trip because like I said, I had a great time. I just will never do that amount I did for one of the worst trips of my life. Well, this has been a shroom trip straight from hell, and I kinda just rambled half the time, so sorry if it felt that way to you. But yeah, I love you all, and want everyone to be safe when you partake in substances like shrooms or any other psych, because it will not always go as planned. This report was written three days following the experience. Me and my boyfriend, a call him Sam, both took half a tab of LSD not long ago while staying in a beach condo by the ocean. 
I was feeling scared to take the acid because of a bad prior experience, but my friends told me prior experience was a research chemical being sold as LSD, so I figured I would give it another shot. I suggested half a tab to start with since I was told it was really strong and I was feeling super nervous. We took a half tab of LSD each and watched a movie on Netflix while we waited for it to kick in. The LSD gave me serious diarrhea and I had to get up and use the bathroom maybe five times. I eventually gave up watching the movie to go sit in the living room to meditate. This was the first time I've ever really reached enlightenment from meditation. Everything turned into light and I felt like I was no longer my body, but I was the surface of my skin. My body felt like an empty shell being filled by light, and I was the feeling of the ocean breeze. Sam wasn't feeling the acid kick in yet, so he kept bothering me and snapping me out of it. I tried getting him to join me in meditation, but it wasn't hitting him very much yet. Sam wanted me to go downstairs and cuddle with him. I was pretty reluctant because I was feeling so good meditating, but he was insistent, so I went. We cuddled for a bit and then we both got up to use the bathroom. When I looked in the bathroom mirror, I felt like I could see through my skin. And I don't mean like flesh and blood. I mean, I could see my essence. Under my skin was fragments of gray rot, constantly shifting. I looked repulsive, demonic even. I looked like my soul was void of love and joy and just filled with pain. I had to turn off the lights and leave. I just couldn't bear looking any longer. When I walked out of the bathroom, Sam was walking down the steps. I told him what happened and that I thought I was a monster and I asked if I was really that ugly. He consoled me and made me feel a lot better. I don't remember much of what happened between this and when we got back downstairs on the bed, so I'm going to fast forward to the scene on the bed. We were both downstairs laying on the bed staring at the ceiling. I was watching the flat popcorn ceiling turn into three-dimensional layers of surfaces and shifting. I started telling a story my friend told me about how a cat would sleep on his friend's face to try to kill him. This made Sam super upset. He just couldn't stand my story. I consoled him to make him feel better. And this is when things got really bad. He started kissing me softly and being gentle, affectionate, and warm. He got closer and with his head in front of my face looking down, he said in a soft voice, You know how you said you were a monster earlier? He looked up with his face centimeters away from mine. His eyes were bulging out of his head and pointing in different directions. He had a grin on his face and he whispered, Well you are. I don't know how to explain this, but the life literally got sucked out of the room. I truly feel like this was the moment a demon emerged from my boyfriend's body and got a grasp of the surface of his mind. I felt scared for my life, like he was going to kill me at any moment. I was alone with an empty man in a silent room. I tried snapping him back to reality and was like, Sam, what was that? He said he was trying to make me feel the way he felt. He started acting normal again, and the room was no longer a glimpse of hell. I ignored what happened and proceeded to have a good time. We went upstairs, and this was the peak of my trip. Sam's face turned into a pattern of faces stretching down from his chin and up from his forehead. His physical face occurred to me was a crystallized form of the pattern. His eyes repeated on his eyebrow and the dent on the forehead. I was incapable of responding to him. I was too caught up in the other world to react. 
Every bend in the ocean turned into fragments of soft glass reflecting the sky. It was so beautiful. We went outside, but Sam got super bad anxiety, so he came back in immediately. I was so disappointed I couldn't go swimming, but he said we stuck out too bad. I tried explaining that he was just being paranoid, but that threw him into a rampage of complaining and insulting me. He snapped out of it and realized what he did. This then happened a few more times, and when he snapped out of it, he was crying and saying he was a monster for treating me so badly all the time. He was crying and crying saying I should leave him and that he should die. This was the first time in the two years of dating him that he's ever admitted to doing anything wrong. Other than this one time, everything that goes wrong in our relationship or his life has always been my fault. Usually he screams at me and makes my life unbearable until I say sorry and take the blame, but not this time. He apologized for everything he's ever done and I told him I loved him forever and that everything was okay. We proceeded to have a great rest of the night. I went to draw and he did math. The next day, he strangled me. This was the first time he ever physically hurt me. I was washing the dishes and he silently came up behind me and put his hands around my neck just tight enough so that I could not breathe. I knew that if I struggled, his grip would get stronger, so I stood there catatonic listening to him. He whispered in a soft voice behind me that I was a monster and that he was wrong about the day before. I was responsible for his pain and suffering. He grabbed me by the hair and threw me onto the couch, pinning me down. I was petrified, frozen with tears running down my face. He kept screaming, demanding a response, but I couldn't come up with anything. He went into the kitchen and swallowed ten pills. He said he was killing himself. I started bawling, crying, demanded he throw them up. But then he said he faked it and then drank a quarter bottle of rum. The rest of the day was hell. I was scared for my life. I had to clean up the beach house before we left and sometimes he would just sneak up on me and just stand there looking at me with a crazy smile on his face in silence. I actually had to go outside on the balcony in view of other people so that he would not hurt me. Aside from fearing for my life, the colors of the balcony were amazing. The sand looked like a beautiful pink against the blue sky. The last few days have been really bad. He has repeatedly threatened to kill me, and I don't know what to do or what happened to my boyfriend. He has always been mean, but never like this. His father used to beat his wife, but I didn't think that would mean Sam was violent. While I had a fantastic trip, I think that LSD brought something evil inside of Sam to the surface. I used to think drugs were for everyone, but now I certainly don't. I see how it can sometimes bring the worst out of people instead of the best. I am very unsure of what to do with our relationship and how to fix this, or even if I can fix this. I thought I'd do a personal trip report horror story, since I haven't done one since the Hawaiian Baby Woodrose one last year. If you are new, or you watch my videos without subscribing, please subscribe. You can really help a brother out. The more views I get, the more effort I'm going to put into the next video, and I don't think any of you want piss poor content. Alright, so this was my near psychosis diphenhydramine trip, and no, I haven't done this drug since, and I never will. The story starts off on a normal to average day hanging out with a friend we'll call Jay. This trip happened over three years ago so I'm not going to remember some of the parts and I'm definitely not going to remember the parts I didn't remember at the time. 
This was at a time I was addicted to a nootropic called Phenobut, which if you take in moderation can help anxiety and boost your mood. Well, like an addict, I overdid this drug and was doing 6 to 8 grams every time I did it, and this was about 3 times a week. When you use Phenobut, you're only supposed to do like a half gram to a gram, maybe up to 2 at the most, but like I said, I was addicted. I started to drink the Phenobut, which I ended up enjoying the taste of after a while. It does not taste good by the way, but for some reason I didn't mind. We were just chilling while I was drinking it, and we were wondering what we were going to do, and I thought it would be a good idea to drive out to Geneva, which was about a 30 minute drive. And Geneva has a nice downtown area, and this whole huge stretch of activities, shops, restaurants, and more on the lake. Kind of like a little tourist attraction area and fun stuff to do for the kids. Been going there since I was born. Anyway, we get into the car, and I'm not high at all yet, because Phenobut takes a little to kick in, and so my dumbass said grab your diphenhydramine. At the time, I was taking a lot of that too. I've never combined the two, but I thought it was a good idea to do it that day, but I should have never combined them. I don't even know how much diphenhydramine I took, but I knew it was a lot. Before we got onto the freeway, I went into the gas station to grab a couple tall boys of beer, and yes, I drank one on the way there. Before you utter your distaste for me driving under the influence, I was 19 years old and a stupid fucking kid. My friends and I always drove under the influence of alcohol or whatever substance we were on, and we never got into an accident, so we thought we were invincible. Being 22 now, I haven't driven under the influence since this incident. Maybe a couple beers or two, but that doesn't even make me tipsy. So yes, I know I was wrong, but like I said, I was stupid. I'm getting paranoid and cringing just typing this right now. As I'm driving, I'm drinking the tall boy, and the drugs start to hit me. Also, mixing Phenobut with alcohol is very dangerous too, so please don't mix them or any drugs together. I'm lucky to be alive for my stupidity. We're listening to this one song called Hours by the band Tycho, and if you don't know the song, it's just like a really ambient and psychedelic tune that always calms me down. As I was listening, I was looking at all the road signs that were passing, and the song represented time as we were getting closer and closer to where we wanted to go. My friend asked me like 10 times on the way there how I was feeling, and I always said, good, with a little chuckle after. Up to this point, I thought I was going to be fine driving the rest of the way but after we got off the exit was when I started swerving. It was such a deserted road and the speed limit was only 25 miles an hour, so there was never a worry in my mind that I was gonna hit someone. I shit you not though, I really could not drive. Driving under the influence of these three things mixed together is a million times harder than to drive on just alcohol or each other substance separately. Luckily, we were close to the downtown area and I surprisingly parked in a spot I probably could not even see. We get out, and I don't remember anything from walking around the area. What I do remember is when we got back to the car. A couple was waiting by the front of our car, and he started yelling at me because apparently my front hit their car when I parked it. But we looked at it, and my car was not even touching theirs. My friend can attest to that, that I did not hit it. The only thing I can think of is that they backed the car up a little bit before we got back, but other than that, I have no idea. So they walked away after that and I got a sigh of relief because I thought they were going to call the police or something. I didn't have car insurance with this car because I was a poor fucking bastard who grew up in a section 8 apartment complex and grew up on food stamps, but luckily had a caring mother. I bought the car for $1200 with the money I got from financial aid for college. I don't want to make a sob story here because there's definitely people out there who had it way worse than me, but I definitely wasn't anywhere near middle class. So not getting pulled over for driving almost two years in that Buick uninsured really could have fucked me over if I ever got a ticket. Back to the story. I had my friend drive the rest of the way to the lake area, and that was probably the smartest decision I made all day. When we got to the lakefront, I remember it being really hot, but I don't think it was super hot. I think the drugs made me feel hotter than it actually was. The only thing I remember from walking around was me complaining about the heat. I had no sense of time there, so I don't even know how long we were there for. So after however long, we left. I also don't remember any of the drive back to our hometown, but I do remember going to a grocery store and getting more beers. My friend was getting real concerned with me because I was babbling nonsense to him and he thought I was going through psychosis, which I probably was. The next thing I remember was going back to his house, and apparently I had eaten toothpaste. I did not believe him because why the fuck would I eat toothpaste? But I guess I did. 
After this whole day of being fucked up, I still haven't come down in the slightest, and no, I did not see any hallucinations or anything, or at least that I can remember. But it was getting to be around 4 to 5 p.m., and I needed to get home, and I really wanted him to drive me. But his dad was pissed at him because his dad was always in a bad mood. And so I had to drive myself home, and this was when the scariest thing that has ever happened to me occurred. As I was driving, I started to drift in and out of sleep. I do not know if I was swerving or not, but I probably did fall asleep for a few seconds. I had to go over a bridge to get back home, and I guess I was asleep, because the next thing I heard was a semi-truck. They honked their horn as loud as possible, and it sounded like it was coming from my passenger seat. I got bolstered back into reality when I realized where I was. I immediately got out of it. When I woke up from the diphenhydramine haze, it seriously looked like I was under the semi. I was in reality inches away from the huge tires that were bigger than my car. I saw the truck driver waving his hand to try to tell me to move, and boy, did I. I felt so humiliated and fearful at the same exact time. I could have got crushed by this 25,000 pound semi driving over a bridge that probably would have caused a huge accident involving others and killing me. I don't know what the people around me were doing because all I could focus on was how I nearly just cost myself my fucking life. I am so thankful that truck driver was vigilant and honked his horn so I could be here today typing this story and getting anxious just recollecting the events. After I got myself back into my lane, I drove with two hands on the wheel, eyes wide open, and not missing a beat. I remember the whole way back to my apartment. That honk made me feel like how you feel when you're falling in your dream and you're about to hit the ground, but wake up just in time. That's the best way I can describe it. When I thankfully got back to my apartment, I sat in my car for a couple minutes and started to cry. Even under the influence of all those drugs, I was the most sober I've ever been. It's like my brain canceled out all the effects for the last 20 minutes as a survival tactic for us to both come out of this alive. After letting my emotions out, I stumbled into my apartment and my mom was home, so I was a little worried that she would find out, but I've come home under the influence so many times that I knew how to get past her without making her suspicious. To end the worst experience of my life that I'm super embarrassed to even share with you all, there's something funny that happened. I went to go put on my basketball shorts to get comfortable and it was a huge struggle. I got them on eventually, but I looked down and my underwear was over my shorts and my mom's back was turned so she didn't see this. If she did, she definitely would have known I was on something. The last thing I remember from that day was falling asleep on the couch and thanking God that I got to live another day. This was by far the most horrifying experience I've ever had. Do not mix drugs together, especially the ones I did. The consequences can be severe and nearly fatal, or if you're unlucky, even kill you. I got super lucky that day and I'm thankful for every day that I have on earth. It was one of the biggest learning experiences I've ever had. If I can take anything positive from this trip, it would be that I'm a lot smarter now. I do not take drugs like that anymore, and I barely even drink. I do take Kratom daily though, but that's not something terrible like the stuff I was taking. If you're ever thinking about taking drugs like I did, maybe think twice, because you may not be as lucky as I was. I don't want to tell you what or what not to do, but this experience definitely changed my life, and hopefully, it will change yours. I see a lot of comments saying about how I'm showing drugs in a bad light, and that's not what I'm trying to do. This channel's purpose is to do horror-related drug content, and with all positives to drugs, there are also a lot of negatives. As long as you're smart about consumption, you'll be fine. But if you're a dumbass like I was, then you should stay away. Don't overdo it, and don't be stupid. Thank you all for listening to my story, and have a good day. I must say that after I found out what fucked me up, I got pissed. I cut off my ties to that sick prankster. My friend was throwing a Halloween party. He said costume only. Don't worry about drugs, alcohol, etc. My girlfriend already felt threatened by me going without her since she had to work that night. The house was only lit up by black lights. We smoked a little bit of chronic weed to shake off the edge of a bad day. About 30 minutes later, we all grabbed a cup and scooped some cold tea from the punch bowl. 
I cannot remember if it was 15 minutes later or 45 minutes later, but I ran to the toilet bowl and puked my guts out. As soon as I felt the dry heaps fading, the floor was crawling. I heard many whispers, static voices, and faint screams. I opened the bathroom door and no one was there. I remembered everyone was outside in the backyard partying. When I got out back, everyone who was there either were laying in a comatose daze or were in small groups talking as if they were on helium. Laughter and crying erupted at the same time. I was in control after messing with PCP, LSD, X, DMT, and various hallucinogens. I only felt like I was going to get sick again. Sure enough, I puked all the water I downed an hour later. Some girl who also lived there felt sorry for me and took me to her room. As I lay in a stupid delirium, she was forcing her tongue down my throat. I was too weak to push her off. I couldn't feel her giving me head. I couldn't tell if I was erect or not, but I felt a cold tingling sensation when she sucked harder. She wiped her mouth off and asked if I liked the nightshade I was so fucked up on. Her eyes looked transparent and geometrical. I felt a weird rush and this must have been three hours into the trip. I lost memory after that, but vividly remember puking constantly at 7am somewhere downtown and having a hell of a time finding my car. I rested the entire day and felt like I was going to die. I don't think it was cool not telling the guests what they were on. My experience was mixed. The aftermath isn't worth discussing. I lost a girlfriend over it. I also lost memory over it. I wrote this report mainly to get it off my chest because it is a day that I cannot even bring up or even try to think about. So I hope by writing this report it will help get rid of some of the anxiety left behind from this day. I am 19 years old and was just about out of high school. Summer was just around the corner and the roles were available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. I consider myself to be very experienced with the drug, having at the time done it about 40-50 times, almost all on relatively high doses. I also had a tight group of about 5 or 6 friends who I used to and continue to still roll with. For the amount of times I had rolled, I had experienced the cleanest, finest rolls, to the dirtiest rolls cut with who knows what. Though at the time, our very good friend was consistently getting very clean, legitimate roles for somewhat of a long period at this time. I trusted him, and I still do. Now to the day I will never forget. It started off, we were at my friend Nate's house, a place we always go and feel very comfortable. Several of us decided this is where we were going to start taking our roles before going out to a big house party later that night. There were about eight of us all together, though only four of us planned to roll. It was me, Alex, Ben, and my friend Matt. Alex and Ben being very experienced just like myself, while Matt was a newcomer to this drug, though I really talked him into doing it because I thought I could give him some of the spiritual enlightenment that it had given myself. Matt was a great friend, though at times did not have much self-control. He was an all-state wrestler who got kicked off the team for punching a ref in the face, and he would fight just about anyone for anything you could think of. He was also going through depression over his girlfriend. I really thought that taking this drug would really help open his eyes to a lot of things. Boy, was I wrong. At around 6 o'clock, the four of us took our first dose. I took two of White Roses. Like I said, there was about eight people there, including the four rollers. Being in an apartment, there were about four of us inside and four of us outside. I began to feel my roll about 30 minutes into it and was really looking forward to it because the coming up was feeling really clean and smooth. I was playing video games inside with Matt, who I could tell was starting to feel the coming on effects. 
I was just talking to him, and from what I could tell, he felt slightly uncomfortable. But from the way the rest of us were feeling, I figured there was nothing to worry about, and I was starting to feel great. Another half hour passes. It's about 7 o'clock, and I step outside with Alex and Ben, and we all just look at each other saying how great the E was, and we began to smoke a cigarette. At that point, it seemed like the night was starting to kick off, and everything was going to be great. All of a sudden, Matt walks outside with tears in his eyes. Like I said before, Matt is the type of kid who is always proving how tough he is, and always fighting. He would never show us tears. I look at Matt and say, Matt, what's wrong, man? He is bawling his eyes out, and we sit him down and ask him what's wrong. He doesn't waste any time, and he says, I gotta tell you guys something. You're gonna look at me so much differently. In my head, I'm like, I don't even want to know because I knew it was going to be bad. When Matt was 13 years old, he had done time in a youth detention center and lived his young age in a cell. I tried to keep what he was about to say back because I knew from the looks of things that it was not the time. I really wanted to talk to him and he just let it all out, explaining to us that when he was 13 in placement, he had been raped by a staff member at the center he was at. And that's the reason he fights as much as he can, because he feels that is the only way he feels like he can get back into his manhood. Wow. Those words hit me at a hundred miles per hour. This is a 19-year-old kid who I really liked and respected, even after he told me this. I did not think any differently of him. If anything, I respected him more. After realizing what he had just said, it hit Matt extremely hard. He was crying harder than ever, begging us to beat the shit out of him because he didn't feel like a man. Now this is one of my best friends telling me this. It really fucking hurt me to hear this. The people inside took notice to what was going on outside. My friend Nate asked us to take a walk. He could tell something was wrong and told us to come back and try and get him to calm down. We began the walk. This is in the city, in somewhat of a rough area. Me, Matt, Alex, and Ben. Alex and Ben were handling the situation very well at the time, and I was as well. We talked to Matt, trying to calm him down, and he at one point was really starting to cool down and realize we were his friends even after telling us this. Then the E must have been hitting him at full force because he would, in the blink of an eye, go from almost accepting what he had told us back to complete anger and pain. He started punching himself in the face very hard. And even at one point, trying to jump in front of a car to take his life. Going back and forth from accepting things to anger would not stop. One second, we would think he was snapping back into it, but then he would go right back to the craziness. He had another roll in his pocket, and we knew we could not let him take the second. He was too emotionally wrecked at this point and was already starting to lose it completely. Alex tried to talk Matt into giving him the roll. This is when Matt got extremely hostile, wanting to fight. This is when I tried explaining to him why I gave him a role in the first place, to try and help him realize things and that the fighting is out of control and how he was just about to fight his friend. He continued to cry and apologized and he promised he wasn't going to take the role, he was just going to hold on to it. We agreed knowing that he was going to try and take it, but to just try and let him calm down before we have to hold him down. Our walk was finished and nothing was really accomplished. The other four kids at the apartment were all outside. At one point, the ice cream truck went by, causing Matt to run around like a little kid with complete joy. 
The other four laughed at him, not realizing the situation completely. They said to us that they wanted to head to the party already. I talked to Nate telling him Matt wasn't ready and asked if we could stay there with him and head there later on. He agreed. Ben left us at this point with the other guys and it was now me, Alex, and Matt at our friend Nate's apartment. We all sat down and Matt was starting to act even more and more out of tune. Though not crying anymore, or not feelings of pain, just not knowing anything that was going on. I asked him about his other role, and he gave me the bad news. He ate it on his walk. I looked at Austin, knowing it was going to get worse. Within 15 minutes, Matt's legs started shaking uncontrollably, and one of his eyes was about swollen shut from hitting himself so damn hard. Both of his legs were violently shaking and his eyes were beginning to roll in the back of his head. We both sat there trying to keep him concentrated and not let something terrible happen. We had all taken two of these roles and me, Ben, and Alex had been fine. But Matt was completely starting to have a serious problem. He was chewing with his mouth like he was chewing on gum and we heard him crack one of his teeth from chewing on nothing so hard. I would grab him and try and talk to him, but it would not help. I would try to give him water and it would all just come down his mouth and the violent shaking would not stop. He asked me if I was his dad and why I left him and his mom. He began talking to us like we were other people in his life that had somehow hurt him in one way or another. He talked to me like I was his girlfriend, violently shaking with his eyes rolling in the back of his head, telling me he loved me. I could not believe what was happening. After about 25 minutes of shaking, he slowly started to stop and could at some points hold a conversation. It is about 8 o'clock now and me and Alex knew we had to wait it out until the E really began to start wearing off before we were about to bring Matt anywhere. Matt was really feeling upset at some points when he realized the situation. We would explain to him that he can take control of what is happening and that everything is going to be alright. And once again, he would go from almost feeling the way he should be, right back to the pain and anger, wishing he was dead. At about 8.30, during another point of almost being normal, he said he was ready to try to get up. I thought he was back. We stood him up. He took one look at the light in the room while standing up and fell to the ground, babbling on about me being his dad, asking if I loved him and his mom. The babbling, the crying, the feelings of happiness, they were all mushed together, and he was experiencing so many feelings all at once. It was way too much to handle. At about 9.30, he had realized where he was and what he had been doing. The E at this point made him pretty happy, but he was still a little oblivious. Me and Alex at this point were just very frustrated and were not on the same page as him as far as the happiness. He told us we were his best friends and he loved us and then continued to tell us a couple more things about himself that I really didn't want to know. It was nothing like the first thing he had said though. So after about four hours of craziness, complete craziness, I decided not to go to the party and just to get dropped off at home. Matt told me he loved me when I left. I went home feeling really upset about the whole thing. Matt was without a doubt going to be looked at differently and I knew that Alex or Ben was going to tell at least someone and people would find out. Matt was an extremely tough kid who did know how to work very hard, lifting, training, etc. and really never took shit from anyone, though he just took it to another level quite often. Matt called me at about 11 o'clock the next night telling me he took three roles and was begging me to still be his friend. 
I yelled at him for taking the rolls and said I was still his friend and to never take those again. The next day in school, I saw Matt and once again, he had taken the rolls that morning at school. Talking to him at school that day was like talking to a zombie. He was emotionally drained and he was not the same person I knew and respected. After these three days, Matt was never the same again, or even close to the same. He began to abuse ecstasy on a very regular basis, and within three weeks of that day, he was completely gone. A kid who was on his way to the Air Force, an extremely hard worker, and just all in all, a damn good friend, was now a ghost. He started breaking into people's houses and would steal from people who try to continue being his friend. I saw Matt about two months after the day. I had seen him since then. It had just been about a month since I had seen him. I had tried to help him greatly. I had just reached a breaking point and knew he was gone. So after about a month of not seeing him, I saw him at a local spot. There were two gangsters around him with a lot of people we knew watching. Matt had robbed one of the gangsters, and right as I showed up, it was about to go down. When Matt was the Matt I knew, there was almost no doubt in my mind he would have flattened both of them at the same time, with a lot of ease. But the new Matt was terrified, almost in tears, begging for them not to hurt him. Me and my friends talked to the gangsters and they left. I did not see Matt after this day because he later got put in jail for breaking into houses. This day proved to me how extremely powerful ecstasy really is. Like I said prior to this, I had taken a lot of X about 45 different times and I had taken 5-6 to six rolls on many different nights with almost no side effects. I am a bodybuilder and a football player accepted to college and never felt lasting effects of roles, but after that day, I did, and I continue to. All it takes is hearing the song One Blood because it was on while Matt was shaking uncontrollably. Just simple things reminding me of Matt bring me back to that day and giving me a feeling that I cannot explain, like I'm rolling, and having all these feelings hit me very hard almost like a train at times. Luckily though, this has gotten better due to the fact that this was about six months ago. I started off at around 10 p.m. with a weighed out 35 milligram dose in the vape. I was sitting in my living room and the trip went well enough. I had my eyes closed and I got those colorful fractals but the main thing I felt during that trip was another entity in the room with me. It was trying to tell me something, maybe a warning about something, but I couldn't understand it. I came back and decided I needed to know what that message was. I waited a half an hour and threw in roughly 45 to 50 milligrams more into the vape. This time I laid in bed with just a dim Himalayan lamp in the corner. I took off again and I went back to that same place as before. The fractals and the feeling of there being another entity in the room. I could feel and understand those same entities giving me a message. They were telling me to stop doing something. I still didn't know what the warning was. I remember the sensation of being in handcuffs. It was as if the spirits were giving me a stern warning. After I came down from that, I still felt like I was missing something. I still wanted to know what they were trying to tell me. In retrospect. I wish I had the insight to realize that this wasn't the time and I should sit on what I had experienced. I then made the foolish decision to try one more time and see what I could get out of it. I waited another 45 minutes to one hour and then packed the vape again. This time, I decided I wanted to try and do a much larger dose than I ever have before. I thought that would be enough to give me the right message. I packed the vapes chamber with roughly 120 to 140 milligrams of fluffy white DMT crystals. I laid down in bed again and took off. It was hard to get it all down, but I managed to inhale everything in one hit. Within 15 seconds, everything went dark, and there was this brown matter pushing all around me. 
I felt a cold wind and a lot of negative energy. I was seeing this brown stuff shooting out of the room with pieces of black in it. The best way I can describe it, it is like a mixture of thick, dark brown mud being shoved around the room. The black pieces looked like pieces of plastic. It was all moving so fast and I had no idea what was going on. This is when everything went black. The brown stuff went away and it was silent and black for a brief amount of time. Then I felt like my body was being physically pushed into a fetal position. I started seeing and feeling these matte black rods pushing against every inch of my body. This is when I started to panic. I instantly knew that I was in another dimension. I started crying. I wanted to go home. I wanted to scream out for help, but the only sound I could make was this deep, guttural groaning sound. All I knew is that I wanted to go back to Earth. I started just kicking my arms and legs back and forth. I couldn't see my body, but I could feel it. I could feel those plastic rods and boxes pushing against my body with an incredible amount of pressure. I was kicking and groaning and I realized that this was hell. I felt as though I had managed to do so much DMT that I was removed from Earth and dumped into another dimension that I would never get out of. I was pulling at my clothes and could feel the silky material around me that I started trying to rip up. I kept pulling and it kept coming down around me. This is when I started to have a modicum of acceptance of the situation. I messed up and now I would need to pay the price. I had essentially given up. I just wanted to rest, to lay down and have my soul die. I couldn't do this for eternity. I longed for comfort. I decided to lay down and stop fighting, but I couldn't. When I laid down, it was as if those plastic shapes were not only pushing against me, but also falling. It was as if the ground wasn't there, and every time I tried to put my head down, the plastic rods gave way to keep falling. All I could do was keep kicking, kicking back and forth trying to get out of that fetal position, and dry heaving was all I could manage. All I wanted was to get comfortable, and I just kept falling through this dark space. I started to really panic, and was overcome with sadness. I had accepted that this was my new reality, but I wanted to know what happened to the real world. Was my dog going to be taken care of? What would my parents think? Was my body still in my bedroom, or did I just vanish into this other dimension? Is the world even there anymore? I truly believed that I had pushed myself into a dimension that we are never supposed to see. I then felt this hell I was in morphing. I started to get a vague sense of my room. Although I could sense where I was, everything was still breaking apart and I thought that this was hell trying to kick me. The room was dark and those rods were coming out of the wall. I pushed out of the bedroom and walked into the living room. I tried to touch the couch and the wall, but when I did, they broke apart into those plastic rods. My dog was in the corner scared, but she wasn't my dog anymore. She was a terrifying goblin shape. I decided I had to see what was outside and see how far I could venture into my new and permanent reality. Even though I felt it was all an illusion, I was so hot in my house and wanted to see what else this hell would put in my way. Maybe I felt like I could still escape this dimension. Somehow I grabbed my house keys, out of habit probably, and I walked out into the street. Nothing felt real. Everything I looked at seemed to be breaking apart. I started walking up to parked cars and trying to touch them to see if they were real. The thing is, they didn't look like normal cars. They were some sort of futuristic vehicle and they all had a menacing look. I was now completely convinced that this hellscape was trying to trick me into thinking I was still alive. I could feel the entity that put me here watching me and laughing at my futile attempts to escape. I walked down my street over to the main road. There were people walking, but when I would walk up to them, most just walked right by me. I then stopped to ask some people for help, and everyone just kept going. I went up to one couple and said hello, and they said hi, and kept walking like everything was fine. I ran up to cars trying to get people to help. The cars were racing by me, and they all looked so much scarier with the lights on. I knew that I was dead, and this whole thing was an illusion, but I felt the dire need for someone to help me. I was screaming help me over and over again. I went up to one guy sitting in his car asking him for help and he looked at me like I was nuts and shut his window. I don't know that I could even call him a guy. He, it, looked like a goblin, similar to what my dog looked like. I was dripping sweat at this point and all I wanted to do was sit in a car with an air conditioning and try to get comfortable considering this was going to be my existence for the rest of eternity. I felt that same need for comfort as I did when I was trying to lay down in my house. He, of course, drove away, 
and I then ran into the middle of the street trying to flag down cars. All the cars were zipping by me, nobody wanted to stop. I started walking back to my house, but I decided that it wasn't actually there, so I stopped. I tried to lay down and everything turned into those plastic rods and I couldn't get comfortable. I eventually decided that I needed the police. I don't know why, but I thought that since this hell was giving me the illusion that I was in the street and still on earth, that maybe I could get taken to a hospital and just settle in there. Maybe they would give me some Xanax or opiates to calm me down. Even if this wasn't real life, I felt like maybe I could take advantage of the situation and try to get some drugs. I had resigned myself to the fact that I wasn't coming back to my real life and just wanted to get comfortable. I needed someone to call them for me, but all of a sudden, nobody was there. I stood in the street trying to stop someone and people were going around me. I ended up jumping on the hood of the next guy that was moving slow enough. I lay down with my forehead against this guy's windshield. There was a foreign guy in the car who barely spoke English and was confused and terrified. I was yelling for him to call the police, which is what he was doing. I wanted him to open the door and let me sit down, but I felt that if I got off the car, he would drive away like everyone else. Then I noticed two guys walking in the street who were asking if I was okay. I kept telling them I needed the police and they said okay and that they were on the way. They then tried to keep asking me what was going on and I could hear some lady in the background saying, he's been calling for help for a while. The cops are on the way. This was when I realized that I was back on earth. I had been put back here for some reason. I jumped off of this guy's car and ran away from all the people trying to help me. I sprinted back to my house and went inside. When I got inside, I found my room completely destroyed. All the sheets had been ripped off and the carpet was turned over. My nightstand was completely on its side as well. I realized that those silky materials that I felt in the hell were my sheets and blanket. As I returned to reality, I called a good friend who helped me calm down. I had to turn on all my lights and I burned some sage to try and expel those spirits. What I believe to have learned from this situation is that hell is very real and very uncomfortable. It is a never ending cycle of wanting to escape but never ever being able to. There is no comfort, no laying down, no sleeping, no eating. It is you trying to relax, but you can't. Every time it feels like you can finally just rest and accept the situation, you find yourself feeling worse and worse. I am terrified of going back to this place. This was my message to stop being selfish. Stop trying to control things. Stop focusing on money. I need to start focusing on helping others and getting closer with God. I do not want to end up in hell and this experience was just a sample of what it will be like. I always thought of death as being either heaven or just nothingness. I know now with 100% certainty that there is a hell and it is as unforgiving of a place as you could imagine. I do not condone the recreational use of Datura at all. It's horrible. So kids, there is no need to eat Datura. Stay the fuck away from it. And if you decide to try it, even after reading this report, and or countless other train wreck experiences, then you are as fucking dumb as I am. My friend C, a long time tripper, gets right into all this kind of stuff, only because he knows how to control Datura, and keeps himself pretty composed on the drug. He gave me a briefing on it, and it seemed pretty wild. So I thought, fuck it, why not give it a go? You only live once, I told myself before I drank that awful stuff. But that quote can also imply that saying jumping off a bridge or forcing yourself inside a meat grinder is a good idea, and it's not. But anyways, one Saturday afternoon, we missioned off to the bottom of Mount Nelson in Tasmania and collected at least 30 or so giant-sized trumpets. We took them home later that day to our share house. Before we got on it, we were confronted by I, one of the wisest Indian trippers you'll ever come across. He told us we were dumb fucks in a bid to deter us from the use of Datura. However, I did not give heed to his words of wisdom. Next thing I know, we put all 30 of the flowers in a giant pot and simmered it in boiling water over the stove until all the flowers looked like soggy spinach. The smell was pretty awkward. I sat in the kitchen watching the stuff boil 
and I could have sworn I was actually getting dosed up on the fumes. I was stoned at the time, meaning my senses were most probably tweaked. My mates, C, R, B, and myself poured the tea into giant cups once it finished brewing. We moved to B's room because it was the warmest and sat around the sacred tea. I was afraid to drink it at first, but B, R, and C got right into it. About 20 minutes later, I was eventually pressured into sculling my share. Immediately after I sculled this shit, B began to talk about how uneasy he was feeling. 30 minutes later, B had already come all the way up. The Datura had taken away his ability to speak. He stood up and looked around the room with great concern. He was wobbling all around the place, unable to center his gravity and speaking absolute gibberish, but gesturing as if he were expecting us to understand what he was saying. He pounced off his bed and ran around the room, knocking over bottles of piss and then eventually slipping in his own puddle of piss. We thought it was hilarious, though we were slightly worried about his and our own well-being. Soon, this shit was going to take us by surprise and we wouldn't be laughing for sure, but for the time being, it was quite humorous. 40 minutes in, I left B's room and went downstairs to the kitchen. I felt slightly euphoric and noticed that the natural lighting of the kitchen was unusually beautiful, almost as if I were in a warmly lit rainforest in dusk. I pieced out in the kitchen amongst the remaining fumes from the stew for a little bit, and then I decided to go back up the stairs and see how the other fellows were doing. As far as I was concerned, things were going well. Just as I was about to head up the stairs, bang, it hit me like a freight train. Motor receptors down. Climbing up those set of stairs was a fucking hard mission. I felt drunk and extremely uncoordinated. However, I didn't get that same head spin I get when you are drunk. It seemed like each premeditated step I took was certainly going to fail to move me to the spot I originally intended, and I was completely aware of it. However, there was no two ways of going about it. Predestined footsteps? I'm sure others who have experienced Datura may have the same feeling. I made it up the stairs eventually and carefully paced myself as I entered the room trying my hardest not to fall in a puddle of piss myself. I really don't recall what happened for the next three hours, a bit like an amnesiac. I didn't quite black out. Time just disappeared and the next thing I knew, I was sitting on the couch of the living room beside two mates of mine. I felt cold and itchy all over the place. There was a burning sensation deep inside my body. I couldn't figure out what was causing it or where exactly the pain was coming from. It was almost as if my anxiety levels had risen so fucking high that it had taken a form of a burning fire. It was agonizing and extremely discomforting. All of a sudden, I realized that I am actually stark naked on the couch. I and A are looking at me like I've gone fucking crazy, and for the time being, I had. Kim was on the other side of the room watching TV. She seemed not to notice what the fuck was going on. C walks into the living room later, with his eyes fixated at a random point in space. It was random as hell. Next thing I know, I whip out a cigarette that I distinctly remember leaving behind my ear. I began a quest in search for a lighter. I continuously search over and over the same square feet of carpet in front of me for a lighter, but I don't find one. Magically, I realize that my cigarette is already lit. Duh, I think to myself, and began smoking it. Moments later, it falls on the floor and I start searching for it, but it's gone. What the fuck? Take a wild guess what I do next. I reach behind the same ear and find another one. However, this doesn't seem to strike me as the slightest bit unusual. I just go on smoking it. Oh, of course, without lighting it first. Another blackout happens. A fraction of my memory is erased, and I find myself naked in bed, hiding under my cover sheets. I is telling me to put on my clothes, but I just tell him to fuck off and began to feel the incessant pain growing inside my body. I still have no idea, till this day, how to describe the pain. 
or have I ever recalled feeling the same way on any other substance except for high doses of diamond hydronate? Right about that time, Kim, being sober, decided to call the ambulance for we had all become a bit like a bunch of zombies with slightly worse motor function skills. The whole lot of us were stumbling around and crashing into everything. I do not recall any of this, but apparently there were two ambulances that arrived outside our house. Three of us were put in one, and B and C hopped in the other one, or rather, were forced. I refused to get into the ambulance apparently, and kept dropping my shorts that were loosely bound to my waist. Our house is directly outside a busy street close to the city. My dick was probably shriveled like a worm because it was one fucking cold night. I woke up, or more or less, recollect the next conscious fraction of my memory from inside the ward of the hospital, being forced to drink this black tar-like ooze, later informed to be charcoal. I kept spilling that shit everywhere, mostly because it was fucking disgusting, and I thought every drop counted towards another drop less in my mouth. And every stain it left on the hospital bed made me curious as to what it was. I seriously thought one of the black spots on the bed sheets were my spectacles. I reached down to pick up my tiny spectacles only to realize it was just charcoal ooze. Then, I think I see a cigarette on my bed. On closer inspection, it turned out to be another black spot. I repeated this method over and over again until I finally finished the black stuff. A nurse arrives and takes a pen. She puts the pen on the tip of my index finger and a sharp needle protrudes and sucks the blood out of my finger. I tell her to fuck off. She leaves soon after. I take a close look at my finger, but there were no blood stains, no needle entry visible. I began to wonder if the nurse was real. From this point onwards, things get really fucking weird. I get up off my bed and search through all my drawers on my study desk in my room at home in search for my glasses. No luck. So I turn around and rummage through my bedside table. I can't find them anywhere. All of a sudden, I realize that I am actually standing in front of the wall in the hospital while feeling up the plaster with my hands. The doctor comes around and sits me on the bed again and tells me to get some rest. I get up straight away and start running for no logical reason, but I stumble and make a scene while laying naked on the floor after my shorts dropped off in the process. I get aggressive and push past the doctors. That's when the security was called and a bunch of them crowd around me and force me back on my bed. I start throwing accusations at the doctors with no actual basis for about what seems to be 20 minutes and continually resist their arrest with serious lack of coordination. I try to punch them all, but my arms feel like a floppy gelatinous rope. They overcome me with ease and throw me inside solitary and tell me they won't let me go for as long as it takes for me to settle the fuck down. They said if I don't make a scene for 15 minutes, they will take me out of solitary. The door shuts and then I begin to yell for what seems to be hours and hours for a reason unknown. I began to search for a way out like some sort of heroic escape artist. I look under the gap of the door and try to squeeze under it, but it doesn't work. I search under the bed for a secret trap door about a dozen times, but every time, I fail. And then I repeat the same process immediately afterwards. I try kicking the solid door a few dozen times until my bare feet are sore. I then think I found the way. I look up and notice the vent between the lights on the ceiling. I climb on top of the bed and jump like a monkey, trying to grab hold of the cheese grater like vent. When that didn't work, I finally gave up hope and sat myself down on the bed. It felt like I had been inside there for years. My thoughts begin to race. I think that I have done some seriously bad crime, eaten the bad fruit, and this was my punishment. Solitary confinement for the rest of my existence, which to me at the time meant eternity. Those thoughts made me angry, so I yelled for a while until I felt tired and eventually settled in the bed. It was truly uncomfortable, almost like a bed of nails. I'd rest assured on a bed like that any other day, like a sleepy lion. 
The delirium begins to kick in hard at this point. My girlfriend at the time suddenly appears next to me. I begin to talk to her and tell her that I am so glad she is here for me. Quite sadly, our conversation is short-lasting and her body dissolves and shrivels into the shape of a black furry object. I look closely and inspect it for a moment, then realize it was only my black jumper. The weird thing is, as soon as I convince myself that I am hallucinating, reality slowly evolves, as opposed to the opposite tendency in many normal, delirious states where reality jumps out at me and then I register that I am hallucinating. Datura seems to grant me the potential to control my hallucinations to whatever I please. However, my mind registers information at a slower pace than visual observation. So I have to be super aware that I am under the influence of tropane alkaloids and that the hallucinations are just mind induced in order to not be freaked out or more or less to enjoy the visual and metaphysical interaction. Soon after, another ghost of my past visits me, a good friend Andy. Andy doesn't say much because he normally doesn't say anything at all. He sat there on the bed looking at the ground, hardly noticing my presence like he normally does. He always wears a black jumper. I call out to him as if he is on the other side of the road. He doesn't respond. As soon as I predict that he is just another hallucination, reality hits me like a very slow crawling turtle. This time I predict his body is just going to shrivel up and turn into my furry black jumper again. And voila, I didn't even need to inspect it three times, learning all over again. Datura makes me feel a bit like a monkey placed in a scientific observation room undergoing a trial and error test with Satan as the scientist. I lay down and stare at the clock on the other side of the room. It says it's 4.30. I'm rather confused as to whether or not it's early morning or late afternoon. Suddenly, it occurs to me that it is my mother's birthday and I must be somewhere at some time. Her birthday was really a week ago but I forgot. I begin to pound at the door and yell at the passerbys through the small slit of the reinforced glass on the door. A police officer walks by, looks at me, then continues in his direction and soon vanishes. Doctors, nurses, and many other official looking staff pass the hall like it's rush hour in a busy street. They all vanish eventually and I constantly fall for it yelling at each and every one of them to let me out of the prison I was in. I look outside and there is a window. Outside, it is bright. Bright and clear daylight and nice bushy trees and flowers line the windows like a garden. I take a step back and look at the clock on the wall, but it's not there anymore. I scan my eyes around my four-walled world and there is no clock, but now there is a television on the ceiling. The reception is blurry, and it takes moments for my eyes to focus, and eventually, I realize that football is playing. The television hangs between two fluorescent lights on the roof. No grate there anymore. It vanishes after a bit of logic jumps in my head. My next delusion. My hospital band strapped around my wrist becomes a Falls Festival wristband, a yearly three-day underground music festival that everyone in Tasmania goes to. I think I have been hospitalized after taking too many drugs during the concert at one point. I lay on the bed, sick and tired of my constant delusions and disappointment, and I watch the television screen. I find I am unable to achieve a peaceful state of mind, constantly twisting and turning and getting up. There appears another window in the room that I hadn't discovered yet. Through the window, there are many office workers sitting around computers like some sort of a telemarketing business office. They all have headphones and speakers strapped to their heads and completely disregard my presence and my constant bashing on the window. It, of course, does not exist. I give up hope and wait for the end of days. The detura begins to wear off at this point, and then I suddenly realized that I am actually under the influence of detura for the first time this evening. Time passes and I feel more stable, although I do smoke a couple more phantom cigarettes, stumble about, and maybe see a few more hallucinations, but finally, I regain myself.
and the door of the hospital is opened. A lady walks in and tells me I can go in 15 minutes, and I just sit there crying. Something makes me really sad, but what? I do not know. I rendezvous with the other fools for my share house. They all look exhausted and majorly fucked. I ask them what time it is. C tells me it's 7.30 in the morning. The whole evening I was under the concept that it was still daytime and that I would make it to my mother's birthday until I asked for the date and realized her birthday was a week ago. It gives me a bit of relief. Funny thing was, all three of us shared some of the same hallucinations, even though we were put in different wards, and I was confined in a solitary room. C, B, and myself all imagined the wristband was a false festival band, and also saw that same white clock on the wall that said 4.30. Quite scary, actually. C also mentioned that he received messages telekinetically, and heard me yell out to him and his friend B, even though there was no possible way of him being able to hear me from that far. This drug is super strange. Background info on me. I have been fascinated by hallucinogens ever since I first learned about them in my high school health class. Out of all the drugs out there, they seem to have the most profound effects on the mind. Unfortunately for me, I didn't do so well in my hallucinogen presentation. It was rushed and disorganized and I got a bad grade. I took this poor grade to heart and made it a goal to ingest the drugs to get a better understanding of what they were actually like instead of talking out of my ass in attempt to compensate for my failure. So I tried shrooms once and I tried DXM about three times to get an idea of what psychedelics and dissociative drugs were like. I read online that there was another class of hallucinogens I had completely neglected, delirians. A type of drug so scary, almost no sane person would try it, but I couldn't just stop at two categories of hallucinogens, I had to try them all. I thought I could handle this so called scary drug, I was very, very wrong. My first trip. I was considering finding Datura since I lived in Virginia or growing deadly nightshade in my garden, but I discovered that Benadryl is very similar in composition to those two drugs and readily available. Since I was on summer break from college and had a quite a bit of free time to trip out, I decided to head over to a dollar store and pick up some OTC sleep aid to hallucinate, and decided to down about 400 milligrams of the blue pills with a pickle jar full of water. I was told delirians make your mouth very dry. I decided to use the library computer to watch YouTube videos and play a game I downloaded waiting for the sleep pills to kick in. When I first felt it coming on, I had a very strange migraine type headache and thought I was going to have a stroke, so I thought to myself, oh well, it's been a good life, I guess I'm gonna die now. I accepted my fate and at that point my headache died and I began to hallucinate and lose all control of my muscles. I asked the front desk to check out a library book, but I was so severely intoxicated that I could only speak in gibberish. I walked back over to the computer and wondered why the computer was acting wonky. At the time, I thought it was a glitch, but then realized my limbs were so heavy that I simply lost the ability to type. The visuals were quite interesting, but at the time very ominous and sinister looking. As I stared at the screen, it looked as though it was covered in a film of tiny droplets of mineral oil, slowly dripping down the screen around the library. The grain of the wood on the desk started to move like with most other hallucinogens, but something that was unique to this drug was the refractions. It looked as though the entire library was underwater. I also noticed that whenever I looked at an object long enough, the color would slowly fade away. I walked to the bathroom to fill up my pickle jar with more water. I faded out of consciousness. I was awoken when I heard a deafening, distorted shatter and saw water and glass shards scattered across the tile floor. I had accidentally dropped my pickle jar full of water due to the drug's muscle weakening effects. One thing that really bothered me was my heart and my breathing. My heart was pounding away at least 130 beats per minute, maybe higher, and my breathing was shallow. This made it very difficult to walk without becoming winded, and I'm sure if I sprinted, I would have surely died. Another thing that really bothered me were the closed eye hallucinations. 
I saw myself walking towards the entrance of the library, but then I slammed into a car door as it was being opened and realized I was nowhere near the entrance at all and was actually in the parking lot. I apologized to the guy, and in my paranoid state of mind, I thought he would kill me soon if I didn't leave immediately, so I walked away. The closed eye hallucinations on this drug are so realistic that it's hard to tell whether or not your eyes are really closed or open. I had essentially memorized the layout of the parking lot, the library, and the entrance in my mind, all in 3D. I decided to walk home to the room I was staying in, and on the way home, I came across a guy and asked him, are you real? Am I real? He asked. I stared at him with extremely dilated eyes for what seemed like forever before I walked off. On the way, I heard angry screams. Someone was yelling my name as if they wanted to kill me. I never found them. The rest of the day was fine and it had surprisingly little after effects. The second trip where I almost died. It happened in the library again and was quite similar. The second time I took it was a much higher dosage. 750 milligrams, and this was a huge mistake. It started off the same, but this time I blacked out almost completely, leaving gaping holes in my memory. As the drug started to affect me, I lost all control and it warped my perspective. It's a terrible and pathetic thing to witness yourself slowly but surely turning into a psychotic zombie in front of a library full of people. I couldn't make out their expressions, but I'm sure I freaked out all of those people, walking like a zombie and gripping onto the library shelves and falling flat on my ass. I lost my ability to hear and see most things. I got tunnel vision and could only hear or see what I focused on. Everything else was just blackness or my ears ringing. It also felt as though my heart was going to explode. I as a zombie walked up to the info desk to check out a book. They told me that I needed to go to the front desk. I said I need to check out a book. I'm going to have to call someone, the librarian said. I stood there leaning over the info desk to support my weakened leg muscles that felt like they were just noodles made of human flesh. It didn't matter what the stupid librarian said, she was going to check out that book for me. Those are the kind of psychotic and nonsensical thoughts that ran through my mind. She put a phone to the side of her head and moved her lips, but no words came out. Everything was ringing static or just mute. I don't really remember much after that. I was pretty much unconscious and I might have been led to the exit by other people at the library. While I was in the parking lot, a police officer drove by me and asked, Have you seen a suspicious looking young guy walking around in circles? And I told him, No. And he drove off. Now I realize that I was the suspicious looking young guy, but that police officer may have been a hallucination as well. I walked all the way home, something that normally took me 45 minutes to an hour, took me at least 3 hours. On the way home, I had a scenario that played in my mind of crackheads leaping out of the bushes, raping me and gutting me. I thought I was in serious danger and decided to avoid any bushes at all costs. When I got home, I sat on the ground unconscious with my door wide open. When I came to, there I was with a paring knife held up to my forearms ready to end my misery, but then a voice in my head said, nah, and I casually tossed the knife aside. A roommate saw me in a very delirious state with dilated pupils, a sky-high pulse rate, and talking like I had schizophrenia, completely random and disorganized thoughts. I was talking about how walruses were related to waterfalls and tomato sauce when I was asked the question, what's wrong? Luckily, they were a nurse and gave me some sedatives to lower my heart rate. Unfortunately, it made my breathing very difficult, so I was wheeled off to the emergency room. They asked me if I had taken any drugs, and I told them no. I'm really not sure if I was delirious that I had simply forgotten I had taken the drugs, or if it was a defense mechanism, denying everything, fearing that they would send me to the rehab or a psych ward if I told the truth. It may have been both. When I finally took the bus back home, I realized I was still tripping sack. The initial physical effects of the drug were gone, but whenever it was dark outside or when I turned my lights out, my eyes began to vibrate rapidly, and I saw demons everywhere. I even saw my bed sheet slowly but surely transform into a green demon sleeping right next to me. I also noticed pronounced amnesia, depersonalization, and dissociation. I did some things that were strange, pathetic, and very out of character, like blacking out for several seconds and then finding myself furiously masturbating to the picture of the Twilight actress in a Guinness Book of World Records, and I had a vague feeling that I went to a dollar store and demanded they give me my money back. 
because their pills had messed me up. Watching movies was also quite disturbing. When I watched movies or looked at pictures, it felt as though the characters were real, staring me right in the face. To this day, whenever I look at a picture, I am transported into it, or the reverse happens, where the characters are transported into my world, which can be either fun or creepy, depending on what it is. A few months afterwards, I decided to watch the movie Jacob's Ladder, and found it to be surprisingly relevant and very disturbing. The hallucinations in the movie reminded me a lot of what I saw under the influence of diphenhydramine, and towards the end of the movie, I discovered that the Viet Cong soldiers in the movies were gassed with the chemical weapon BZ. After watching, I feared I may have rotted my brain. I knew the initial trip would be unpleasant, but I never expected the side effects could be so long-lasting. Because of this drug, I have extreme panic attacks, hypochondria, and heart problems. I literally can't run at all or stay up too late because it causes me to get butterflies in my chest and feel like death, just like during the delirious trips. The doctors can't find anything wrong with my heart, but I can still feel it. I read online that the heart damage caused by cocaine is often undetectable, and I suspect that it's the same case with diphenhydramine overdoses. I can't recommend this drug to anyone, unless of course they're using small doses for allergies. DXM is much safer and more pleasant. To this day, I think to myself, why oh why didn't I take the DXM? Had I known that diphenhydramine was part of a class of poisons used for mind control, murder, and chemical warfare, these are the drugs that inspired zombies, I might have never taken this awful drug and kept my health and my sanity. Every day feels like my last day on earth. I have been a pretty big stoner for about three years now. I had experienced some minor bad trips before, mostly in the form of delusional paranoia. When I first started smoking weed, I always had great experiences. But after smoking heavily for an extended period of time, the paranoia began to set in. I usually love the highs I get from smoking weed, it makes me feel really good, happy, and comfortable with myself. I love when the smoke fills up my lungs and my mind goes somewhere else. I'm from Colombia, and I have to mention that it is pretty easy to get any kind of drugs down there. I was a really big pothead for about a year and a half. I used to smoke every single day after breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I have also tried X, shrooms, acid, and a bunch of Colombian herbs. I stopped doing any kind of drugs for a while. That was when my parents found out and put me into rehab and made me see a psychiatrist, which I think messed up my head even more. When I got to the US two years ago, I told myself that I was going to try to quit drugs, but this idea didn't last very long until I met my friends, all potheads, drug dealers, and psychos. Now the worst experience I've ever had was from June 21st to June 23rd in 2003. It was a Saturday night when we were all partying at G's apartment. M, E, R, J, G, me, and C were tripping on acid and the others, J, B, 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 were just smoking. The hardest I have ever tripped was with three tabs last year but this time, I took one, and I was going insane. I took the first hit of blotter paper at 9.30 p.m., and I shared the other one with C at 11 p.m. When I shared the last half hit, the first hit was already kicking in, and then we started to drink some orange juice. RJ was our drug dealer, and he used to get everything from N, RJ's best friend, drug dealer, depressed guy, self-employed, 23 years old. I've seen N maybe four or five times. We all have partied together, and I've had maybe two conversations with him. So, back to Saturday night. We were all tripping, especially RJ and E. They were tripping really hard. We were all taking wild turkey shots and smoking like crazy. By 3 a.m., I was on my 10th shot. It was maybe 3.15 a.m. 
and we decided to smoke another bowl in the living room. I started to feel really paranoid, and because I was tripping and smoking since early in the afternoon, my face and legs started to feel numb. I closed my eyes and laid on the floor, and then I had all these funny sensations. Funny pictures, they were all in beautiful colors. Greens and reds and yellows, and they looked like Picasso's pictures. Doors opened up at triangular angles, and there were all these colors in an unreal world. My head was going into crazy thoughts. I wanted to cry, but I couldn't. We were listening to The Doors, I Can't See Your Face in My Mind, my favorite band and one of the best songs, but it lasted forever. It felt like eternity, the same song over and over. This scene now comes up to my mind like flashbacks. I flew out of my own body and I could see myself in a way weirder than an out of body experience because I could see my body on the floor and I could see my soul floating above my body, all from a different perspective. Everything shifted into cartoon form and looked really fucked up. Everything became 2D and flat. The part of me was floating above my body changed form, so I was in 2D. One of its eyes became a spinning spiral, while the other became a flickering eye, which shot occult symbols out. The symbols were constantly floating around the head. Then the soul's head began spinning. Finally, the face stayed the same, and I realized that it was my best friend's face from Colombia, and she was trying to hug me, but she couldn't. Then it became my soul's face again, and it jumped back into my body. After that, all I could hear was Jim Morrison's voice going, Insanity's horse adorns the sky, can't seem to find the right lie. Carnival dogs consume the lines, can't see your face in my mind. Over and over and over. I stood up and went to G's room and laid on the couch while G, C, E, M, D, and RJ laid on the bed. Suddenly, the door opened and it was N. He was crying, nervous, and shaking. He went to the room where we all were, talking and laughing at ourselves. He slammed the door and started to freak out. I can't deal with this anymore. I can't handle this. I'm going nuts. My head. It's all fucked up. This is when my trip turned absolutely crazy. I was on the couch and I was upside down. My feet were on the wall and my head was sort of tilted. I felt my eyes coming out of my face. I moved and then I sat normally. N started to yell at RJ, you gotta get up, you have to help me with this. They went to the bathroom door, but the door was open, so we all saw what was happening in the bathroom. N took a huge ass bag out of his pants. It was full of everything. Little plastic bags full of weed, crack, pills. It had everything and he gave it to RJ. Sell this for me. You're gonna have to call a bunch of customers. And he gave him the bag and a phone book. They got out of the bathroom and RJ was freaking out. N took out a gun and started pointing it at himself. He was crying. I can't do this anymore. I'm way too fucked up. I wanna die. RJ didn't know what to do and he tried to tell N to give him the gun so he could be killed by a professional killer. N was going crazy and he pointed the gun at every one of us, screaming at each other and crying hysterically. At that moment, I had a feeling that someone was sticking their high-heeled shoe into my hand, but I couldn't feel it. I moved my hand and they were wet. That's what I felt. I was seeing fire and N's face looked all blurred. I was freaking out. I tried to tell C what I was feeling, but I couldn't manage to articulate my words enough to do so. RJ and N were arguing for a while. I think it was 4.10 when they left. 
We all decided to smoke a blunt at 4.20 a.m. and play traffic lights, where you can't exhale until the blunt gets back to you. I went to sleep at 4.45 a.m. I had to sleep on the floor. I was still tripping really hard and I felt really uncomfortable on the floor, so I started to think that I was sleeping on a cloud. It felt so good and nice. I wasn't cold or hot. I wasn't happy or sad. I wasn't here or dreaming, when all of a sudden, I began to cry. I was bawling my eyes out so hard that I had to go and wake C up. I hugged her and told her how bad I felt for this kid N. We were sitting in the closet in front of G's bed. We were crying so hard that he woke up and gave us a hug and something to drink. We fell asleep probably at 5.30 a.m. I had the weirdest dream ever. I woke up at 11 a.m. on Sunday and G was crying in the bathroom. Everyone woke up. RJ never got back. We didn't know what had happened the night before until M told us that N killed himself. It was sad, crazy, and unbelievable. D, B, J, C, and me went to Denny's to get something to eat. When we got back to G's apartment, the police were waiting for us. I was so scared because I'm 17 years old. My mom didn't know what I was doing that night, and if the police would have found any kind of drugs in G's apartment, they would definitely send me back to Columbia and messed up my residence papers. They took us and asked us a bunch of questions individually. Nick, N, committed suicide on June 22nd while he was on acid, crack, Xanax, alcohol, and weed. Rich Bonet, RJ, saw him shoot himself. The police found the gun in the pond because RJ panicked and threw it in the lake. That whole entire week, June 21st to June 27th, was the craziest and most fucked up week I have ever had in my short life. Now every time we smoke a blunt, joint, bong, or we take a shot, we do it in memory of Nick. We all went to the memorial, which was pretty sad. All that I can remember now is his face when I was on the couch upside down. I could see really weird shit, like the bullet from the gun penetrating my brain and blood all over. I saw everything and everyone in cartoon form. When we were smoking our last bowl at 4.20, I felt how the smoke intensely filled up my lungs. I remember every single detail. I have also had flashbacks, trails, and mild ego dissolution since then. That was the last time I had tripped. RJ left and E became our new drug dealer. G got kicked out from his apartment and he's now living at E's house. The rest of us keep smoking and trying to live. I sincerely hope this will help somebody in some way. Know yourself and your environment. Don't do too much shit. Enjoy life and be happy. Or die trying. This isn't so much of my experience as it is of somebody else's, which I learned from and feel that others can too. I've been using ketamine roughly once a week for about the past year and considering its effects, me and my friends normally use it after a night out when we have returned home. This unfortunately meant that because we had been out, we had usually used some other drug whilst we were in the club. Everybody knows the warnings about mixing drugs, but it is very rare that anybody pays any attention to them. Me being one of those people. One of the more specific warnings is not to mix ketamine and alcohol. I'm not entirely sure why, but I know it has something to do with them both having depressant effects. This, again, is a warning that is regularly avoided amongst me and my friends. We'd go to the pub, have a few drinks, and then go home and do ketamine. Last night, it was my friend's birthday. 
Him and a group of his friends went to a club, got completely pissed, and then went back to a house party. At this party, they did ketamine. I don't know if all of them did, but my friend definitely did. Because when somebody came downstairs in the morning, he was dead. I don't yet know what happened for definite, but the impression I gathered was that he had K-holed whilst being drunk, had a fit, and choked on his tongue. He was 29 years old. I don't really know why I'm submitting this message. I'm not telling people I think they shouldn't take drugs because I'll openly admit that I will most likely take ketamine again. And yes, I will most likely mix it with small amounts of alcohol at some point. However, I am now much more aware of the fact that these warnings are there for a reason and not just an attempt to put people off taking drugs. What happened this morning to my friend proves that mixing ketamine and alcohol is really dangerous. I'm not preaching, but this experience has made me wonder what will it take for those dangers to really hit home to me. The person who died this morning could easily have been me, considering the states I've gotten myself into sometimes, and I imagine that the only time I'll really learn is when something happens to me. I can't really think of a conclusion to this post except I'm trying to warn people that the warnings we see nearly everywhere are real and that it does happen. Unfortunately, it's too late for my friend but I hope that this will make people more careful because I know that I am certainly more aware of the dangers of mixing these two drugs. I don't even know if any of you know what this drug is, so I'll explain it to you from the great people at Psychonaut Wiki. Clonazolam is a novel depressant substance of the benzodiazepine chemical class, which produces anxiolytic, sedative, muscle relaxant, and amnesic effects when administered. Clonazolam is reported to be roughly 2.5 times more potent as alprazolam. I stumbled across this drug on a research chemical website and didn't know anything about it. I researched it as much as possible and saw other drugs on the website like Atizolam and Flubrazolam, which I believe are also strong. The best information I found on clonazolam was that it was incredibly strong and this should have deterred me, but it only made me want it more. The website was pretty sketchy that I got it from, but I did end up paying for it with a Visa card, which probably wasn't a good idea. I ended up ordering 25 one milligram pills. Researching this drug again, I found out that one milligram is a heavy dose, and that'll become relevant later in the story. Clonazolam was not a controlled substance back when I bought it in 2018. I believe they have changed the law on it since then. But at this point, I didn't care. I was super excited. I called my friend, at the time, about what I just bought, and he didn't seem like he knew anything about it or even wanted me to buy it. Being a 19-year-old doesn't help with making good decisions. Surprisingly, I got the package pretty fast. I think it was only a couple days. Luckily, my mom wasn't home because when I got the package, the little priority envelope it came in was all jacked up and you could see all the pills through the package. Working at the post office myself now, I'm surprised they didn't confiscate it. I brought it inside and I was super excited and I really wanted to take one, but I waited until I was with the same friend I called. Probably a day later, me and the friend who will call Jay from now on hung out. On his way over to pick me up, I took half of the pill. He picked me up and we went to the subway that was close to my apartment. I remember him asking me all the time how I was feeling and nothing was really happening. I didn't think it was a dud or anything, but it was taking a little to kick in. Now, the rest of the story will be a mix of my account and my friend's account of what happened. There are actually videos of me during the peak of this benzo trip, but I don't want to share them because I cringe at them. The videos included me just laying around schlumped on my friend's couch, which I don't even remember getting driven there. In one of the videos, Jay had this puppet, and I put my hand in its back, became a ventriloquist, and started telling a story that didn't even make sense. It was about how the puppet was with his wife and wanted to buy a house in a city nearby. But I said that the real estate agent died the day they were going to get it, so they got the house for free. Oh brother. If that was the best story I could come up with, then that just shows you how fucked up I truly was. 
During this whole experience, my friend kept telling me my eyes kept on rolling to the back of my head. The next thing I remember, or can't remember, is that two other acquaintances came over. I wouldn't call them friends, but we knew them. The one guy was wondering what I was on and wanted one. I think he took the whole thing. He later said it was the most fucked up he's ever been and didn't remember driving home. Luckily though, he did get home safely. Anyways, the other guy, who we'll call S, was trying to play pranks on me while I was fucked up. Jay pulled out some hot sauce and it wasn't like Tabasco or anything. It was like super hot sauce with over 2 million Scovilles. I had no idea what was going on, but the next thing I knew, the hot sauce was already on my lips from them making me try it, and I was burning up. I don't even know how it got on my lips in the first place. I was just sitting there taking it, so they grabbed a frozen water bottle, for which I thought would help me, but I was so fucked up that I didn't even know S put some more hot sauce on the bottom of the bottle. He said to put the water bottle on my lips to calm the heat, and so he got it close to my lips and pushed it in my face really hard. I got hot sauce all over my face. I got so pissed at him because in the video I say something like, you fuck. So that's how I know this part of the story, because it was recorded. I do remember going into his bathroom and putting my mouth under the cold running water. Obviously, it didn't help. But that's the only part of the time at my friend's house that I remember. So maybe hot sauce makes you snap out of your benzo trip. I legit do not remember anything from being there, but I just remember my whole head was in the sink under the cold running water for god knows how long. Nothing up to this point has been truly frightening, so we're going to get to that real soon. After hanging out with those friends, I got dropped off and apparently Jay said that I went into my apartment building and I was looking at him with a blank face through the glass window in the hallway for like 5 minutes. I do not remember doing any of this and I don't remember anything until the next morning because clearly you can't on this or any other benzo. I had to work the next day but I was still super fucked up and somehow managed to get into the shower. My mom was starting to become suspicious, she later told me. This is where the mayhem begins. I try to get out of my shower, but I slip and fall and land on my nose, either on the bathtub or the toilet. I can't remember, and I don't feel like asking my mom to check. My mom hears me fall and comes in. She gets really worried and starts freaking out, as a mother should. There was blood everywhere in the bathroom. I'm literally cringing right now just thinking about it. She called the ambulance for me because I fell, and I'm really glad she did. I didn't feel any pain at the time because clonazolam is that powerful. My body was off on a vacation in Costa Rica, but my soul was trapped in the abyss of hell. She told me the ambulance was coming and I was trying to put my clothes on, but the recurring thing for my bad trips was not being able to put my pants on right. I put my pants on, and after that, I put my underwear on. I really didn't know what I was doing. I was so confused. I eventually got it on because I was not leaving my home with underwear over my pants. I remember the ambulance came. This was at like 8 or 9 a.m., so people at my apartment complex were probably wondering what the fuck was going on. I remember being carried out by two paramedics. I had both of my arms wrapped around their shoulders, and I was basically floating off the ground. The only thing I remember in the ambulance was that they kept asking me what I took, and somehow, under that state of mind, I told them melatonin. They probably weren't buying it, but who the hell cares? I was so fucked up. I got to the hospital, and I didn't even care, or anything. The whole experience was kind of like a daily routine type thing to me, because I was legit so gone, and I didn't think falling out of the shower was a big deal. I took the pill at like 5pm the day before, and I was still fucked up, but later found out why. My mom was probably so worried, and I love her so much, so I feel really bad to this day that she had to suffer. I'm her only child, so if I died, she probably would have died too. I am her everything and love her for it. Plus, my cousin just passed away from an overdose two weeks ago and my aunt is just in complete shock from the whole thing, and so am I.
so I couldn't imagine what my mom would have done if I died during this whole ordeal. Anyway, they put the IV in my arm and the nurse asked what I took and I still didn't tell him. I kept on preaching that I took melatonin and nothing else. So whenever I tell my mom I take melatonin after this incident, she freaks out a little. Jay eventually came to the hospital with his friend C, whom I feel terrible for what I did to him later. They were freaking out with my mom. She pulls out my crate in my head in my drawer and shows it to the nurse, and he had no idea what it was. She said, Is this what caused it? Oh, my lovely innocent mom, never change. The nurse looked it up and he said, It could have been. Jay was pissed after that because he knew what caused it, but he couldn't say anything about it. He was a huge Kratom user at the time. After a bunch of blood work and tests, I got sent home. Before we left, I grabbed a coffee from the hospital, and as I was walking with it, I dropped it all over the place. It got on my hand and all over the ground. They probably cleaned it up, but I thought this was funny and was just laughing away at everything. I then saw an old school friend who was a really nice guy, and he looked shocked to see me, as I was shocked to see him. He is a paramedic, so that's why he was there. J and C carried me out to C's car, and we went back on our way to my apartment. They told me it was the next day, and I remember being so shocked at that. It was around 12 or 1 p.m., and I was just like, what the fuck? They had to keep telling me the whole car ride back that they weren't joking, and it was actually the next day. This drug literally took so much time away from my life. Since I took it up until then, it only seemed like it was just an hour. We get back to my apartment, and they have me lay on my mom's bed to sleep. Well, apparently, I couldn't. I was laughing and having a good time for probably an hour. But this is where the rage sets in. They found my pills and took them. But that made me very angry. I said, don't take them, I'm just going to hold on to them. I'm not going to take them again. They were very adamant about disposing of them far away from me. This made me so mad, and I kept trying to get them from C, but his grip was so strong, and I just couldn't. I'm so thankful to this day I wasn't able to snatch them. At the time, I seriously didn't want to take them, but I just wanted to keep them. We got into a huge fight, and I already didn't like C, so this made me even more angry. They were stopping me with all their force, and I got fed up. So I went to the kitchen and grabbed a knife. It was a knife with ridges on the blade. I headed towards C with the knife to scare him into giving me the pills. I get it so close to his face and get in a stabbing motion when all of a sudden, this crazy motherfucker Jay stops the blade with his hand. It's like in Drillbit Taylor when the bully flings his sword in the kid's direction and Drillbit stops the bladed side of the sword and his pinky comes off as a result of it. It definitely wasn't that severe, because it ended up being just a little cut, but still, that's wild. You're probably thinking he didn't do that, but that's the kind of person Jay was. He was insane. He would always play the knife game, and he had cuts on his hand everywhere. Anyways, he stopped me from stabbing him. Thank the fucking lord. I don't know what my life would be like right now if that knife actually penetrated him. Would I have been uncontrollable and go through with the stabbing? Would I try to stab Jay too? What if Jay never stopped the knife? These questions still haunt me to this day. I felt super bad about what I did to C because I'm a super nice person and would never want to hurt anyone, even the people I hate. I'm sort of a pacifist, but this drug brought out a demon inside me that I have yet to come across since this incident. C wasn't an innocent person though, and he didn't like me either. He was always making fun of how poor I was and where I lived because I was living in a Section 8 apartment. I'm assuming my hatred for him just got built up on this drug. Even though we hung out a lot, I never considered him a friend. After this attempted stabbing, I released all my anger and let go of the knife and started to cry my eyes out. I was still super pissed at C, so I decided to take his shoes and hide them from him. I didn't return them until a couple days later. They stormed out of my apartment. C was probably traumatized, but Jay understood it was the pills that made me do it. All I remember the rest of that day was sleeping in bed, asking for a Baconator meal from Wendy's, and eating it. Thanks, Mom. The next day.
I was still super high, but I can remember the rest. Jay picked me up and I had to go to my workplace to give them my hospital note. I get in there and all the workers were looking at me because my mom called them when I fell and told them what happened. They all asked me if I was okay and told them, yeah, I'm okay. The pain from the fall finally started to set in and my nose was all swollen and gross. After going to my job, we just took a drive and Jay showed me the videos he took. I was dying laughing at them because they are seriously funny. Maybe I'll make them available to certain Patreon members. We'll see. He told me everything that happened and I was just in complete shock because I couldn't believe I did all that. I was so fucked up on clonazolam, it was probably the highest I had ever been. Another nugget of information that's important to the story is that they counted the pills in my container. I said that there was 25 pills in it before, but after, there were only 20. So I had taken a total of 4 milligrams because I gave one to that guy earlier in the story. 4 milligrams of clonazolam would probably kill someone if they aren't as lucky as I was. I know I said this after my personal diphenhydramine video, which you can check out after this if you haven't, but I seriously am so lucky to be alive. If it wasn't for my mom or Jay, I might be six feet in the ground right now. I'm so glad they made this a controlled substance. No one should ever take this shit, ever. Xanax is so much less stronger than this, and I wish I knew how much it was before I took it. Of course I had to deal with the embarrassment of this whole ordeal. My grandpa called me and yelled at me. My mom's friends seemed to get pissed too. Even my girlfriend was telling her friends, who I didn't even know. You wouldn't want people to know your most embarrassing moment. I got super mad at her for telling them because I felt super humiliated after the whole situation. I haven't touched the benzo since then, and this was three years ago. I will definitely keep it that way. This could have ruined my life, but no. I'm still alive and I'm here for a reason, and I'm thankful every day for that. The effects and the high you get from these pills are not worth the nightmare that may be lurking on the other side. I don't recommend this drug at all. Please, if you have it, do not take it or you might end up dead. <laughs>